Hello, welcome to Classic Books with Ostara. And we have been reading Charles Dickens' Dombey and Son. We are on chapter one, and we're going to finish up chapter one, and start chap chapter two, and then summarize chapter one and two together. And let's get to that. Why, my dear, Paul exclaimed his sister as he returned, you look quite pale. There's nothing the matter? I am sorry to say, Louisa, that they tell me that Fanny, now my dear Paul, returned his sister, rising, don't believe it. If you have any reliance on my experience, Paul, you may rest assured there's nothing wanting but an effort on Fanny's part. In that effort, she continued, taking off her bonnet and adjusting her cap and gloves in a businesslike manner. She must be encouraged and really, if necessary, urged to make, now my dear Paul, come upstairs with stairs with me. Mr. Dombey, who, besides being generally influenced by his sister, for the reason already mentioned, had real faith, really faith in her. As an experienced and bustling matron, acquiesced and followed her at once to the sick chamber. The lady lay upon her bed as he had left her, clasping her little daughter to her breast. The child clung close about her with the same intensity as before, and never raised her head or moved her soft cheek, from her mother's face, or looked on those who stood around, or spoke, or moved, or, sh or shed a tear. Restless without the little girl, the doctor whispered to Mr. Dombey. We found it best to have her in again. There was such a solemn stillness round the bed, and the two medical attendants seemed to look on the passive form with so much compassion and so little hope that Mrs. Chick was for the moment diverted from her purpose but presently summoning courage and what she called presence of mind. And she sat down by the bedside and said in the low, precise tone of one who endeavors to take to awaken a sleeper, Fanny, Fanny. There was no sound in answer but the loud ticking of Mr. Dombey's watch and Dr. Parker Pep's watch, which seemed in the silence to be running a race. Fanny, my dear, said Mr. Ch Mrs. Chick, with assumed lightness. Here's Mr. Dombey come to see you. Won't you speak to him? They want to lay your little boy the baby, Fanny. You know, you have hardly seen him yet. I think in bed, but they can't tell you rouse yourself a little. Don't you think it's time you rouse yourself a little, eh? She bent her ear to the bed and listened at the same time, looking round at the bystanders and holding up her finger. A, she repeated, what was it you said, Fanny? I didn't hear you. No word or sound in answer. Mr. Dombey's watch and Mr. Parker Pep's watch seemed to be racing faster. Now, really, Fanny, my dear, said the sister-in-law, altering her position, and speaking less confidently and more earnestly in spite of herself, I shall have to be quite cross with you if you don't rouse yourself. It's necessary for you to make an effort, and perhaps a very great and painful, painful effort which you are not disposed to make. But this is a world of effort you know, Fanny, and we must never yield when so much depends upon us. Come, try. I must really scold you if you don't. The race in the ensuing pause was fierce and furious. The watches seemed to jostle and to trip each other up. Fanny, said Louisa, glancing round with a gathering alarm. Only look at me. Only open your eyes to show me that you hear and understand me. Will you? Good heaven, gentlemen. What is to be done? The two medical attendants exchanged a look across the bed, and the physician, stooping down, whispered in the child's ear. Not having understood the pur purport of his whisper, the little creature turned to her perfectly colorless face and deep dark eyes towards him, but without loosening her hold in the least. The whisper was repeated. Mama, said the child. The little voice, familiar and dearly loved, awakened some show of consciousness, even at that ebb. For a moment, the closed eyelids trembled, and the nostril quivered, and the faintest sh shadow of a smile was seen. Mama cried the child, sobbing aloud. Oh, dear Mama, oh, dear Mama. The doctor gently brushed the scattered ringlets of the child aside from the face and mouth of the child. 
Alas, how calm they, they lay there, how little breath there was to stir them. Thus clinging fast to that slight spar without her arms, the mother drifted out upon the dark and unknown sea that rolls around all the world. Chapter 2 In which timely provision is made for an emergency that will sometimes arise in the best regulated family, families. I shall never cease to congratulate myself, said Mrs. Chick, on having said when I little thought what was in store for us, really, as if I was inspired by something, that I forgave poor dear Fanny everything. Whatever happens, that must always be a comfort to me. Mrs. Chick made this impressive observation in the drawing room, after having descended thither from the inspection of the Mantua makers upstairs, who were busy on the family mourning. She delivered it for the behoof of Mr. Chick, who was a stout, bald gentleman with a very large face, and his hands continually in his pockets, and who had a tendency in his nature to whistle and hum tunes, which, sensible of the indecorum of such sounds in a house of grief, he was at some pains to repress at present. "'Don't you overexert yourself, Lou,' said Mr. Miss Chick, "'or you'll be laid up with spasms. "'I see. Right, toll, lower. Roll. Bless my soul. I forgot. "'We are here one day and gone the next.' "'Mrs. Chick content, contented herself with a glance of reproof "'and then proceeded with the thread of her discourse. "'I am sure,' she said, "'I hope this heart-rending currents will be a warning to all of us "'to make all of us to accustom ourselves to rouse ourselves.' and to make efforts in time where they're, that where they're required of us. There's a moral in everything. If we would only avail of our, ourselves of it, it will be our own faults if we lose sight of this one. Mr. Chick invaded the grave silence which ensued on this remark with a singularity inappropriate air of a cobbler there was, and checking himself in some confusion, observed that it was undoubtedly our own fault if we didn't improve such melancholy occasions as the present. Which might be better improved, I should think, Mr. C. retorted his helpmate after a short pause, than by the introduction either of the, co of the college hornpipe or the equally unmeaning and unfeeling remark of rump tiidity, ba wa wa, which Mr. Chick had indeed indulged in under his breath, and when, which Mrs. Chick repeated in a tone of withering scorn. Merely habit, my dear, pleaded Mr. Chick. Nonsense habit, returned his wife. If you are a rational being, don't make such ridiculous excuses. Habit, if I was to get a habit, as you call it, of walking on the ceiling like the flies, I should hear enough of it, I dare say. It appeared so probable that such a habit might be attended with some degrees of notoriety, that Mr. Chick didn't venture to dispute the position. "'How's the baby, Lou?' asked Mr. Chick, to change the subject. "'What baby do you mean?' answered Mrs. Chick. "'I am sure the morning I have had with that dining room downstairs, one mass of babies, no one in their senses would believe.' "'One mass of babies,' repeated Mr. Chick, staring with an alarmed expression about him. It would have occurred to most men, said Mrs. Chick, that poor dear Fanny being no more, it becomes necessary to provide a nurse. Oh, ah, said Mr. Chick, to a rule such as life. I mean, I hope you are suited, my dear. Indeed I am not, said Mrs. Chick, nor likely to be so far as I can see. Meanwhile, of course, the child is going to the very deuce, said Mr. Chick, thoughtfully to be sure. Admonished, however, that he had committed himself by the indignation expressed in Mrs. Chick's countenance at the idea of a Dombey going there and thinking to atone for his misconduct. By a bright suggestion, he added, couldn't something temporary be done with a teapot? If he had meant to bring the subject prematurely to a close, he could not have done it more effectually. After looking at him for some moments in silent resignation, Mrs. Chick walked majestically to the window and peeped through the blind, attracted by the sound of wheels. Mr. Chick, finding that his destiny was, for the time against him, said no more, and walked off, but it was not always thus with Miss, Mr. Chick. 
he was often in the ascendant himself, and at those times punished Louisa roundly. In their matrimonial bickerings, they were upon the whole a well-matched, fairly balanced, give-and-take couple. It would have been, generally speaking, very difficult to have added on the winner. Often, when Mr. Check seemed beaten, he would suddenly make a start, turn the tables, clatter them about the ears of Mrs. Mrs. Check, carry all before him, being liable himself and similar, and look for checks from Mrs. Check. Their little con contest usually possessed a character of uncertainty that was very uh, animating. Miss Tox had arrived on the wheels just now alluded to and came running into the room in a breathless condition. My dear Louisa, said Miss Tox, is the vacancy still unsupplied? You good soul, said Mr. Chick, Mrs. Chick. Then, my dear Louisa, <coughs> Miss Tox, I hope and believe, but in one moment, my dear, I'll introduce the party. Running downstairs again as fast as she had run up, Miss Tox got the party out of the hackney coach and soon returned with it under convoy. It then appeared that she had used the word not in its legal or business excuse me, acceptation when it merely expresses an individual, but as a noun of multitude, was signifying many, for Miss, Jul Miss Tox escorted a plump, rosy, cheeked, wholesome, apple-faced young woman with an infant in her arms, a younger woman not so plump, but apple-faced also, who led a plump and apple-faced child in each hand, another plump and apple-faced boy who had walked by himself, and finally a plump and apple-faced man who carried in his arms another plump and apple-faced boy whom he stood down on the floor and admonished in a husky whisper to catch hold of his brother Johnny. My dear Louisa, said Miss Tox, knowing your great anxiety and wishing to relieve it, I posted off myself to the Queen Charlotte's Royal Married Females, which you had forgot, and put the question, was there anybody there that they thought would suit? No, they said there was not. When they gave me that answer, I do assure you, my dear, I was almost driven to despair on your account. But it did so happen that one of the royal married females, hearing the inquiry, reminded the matron of another who had gone to her own home, and who, she said, would in all likelihood be more satisfactory. The moment I heard this and had it corroborated by the matron, excellent references and unimpeachable character, I got the address, my dear, and posted off again. Like the dear good talks you are, said Louisa. Not at all, returned Miss Tox. Don't say so, arriving at the house, the cleanest place, my dear. You might eat your dinner off the floor. I found the whole family sitting at table, feeling that no account of them could be half so comfortable to you. Mr. Dombey at the sight of them all together. I brought them all away. This gentleman, said Miss Tox, pointing out the apple-faced man, is the father. Will you have the goodness to come a little forward, sir? Excuse me. The apple-faced man, having sheepishly complied with this request, stood chuckling, grinning in the front row. This is his wife, of course, said Miss Tox singling out the young woman with the baby. How do you do, Polly? I'm pretty well, I thank you, ma'am, said Polly. By way of bringing her, own, out, her out dexterously, Miss Tox had made the inquiry as to in condolences to an old acquaintance whom she hadn't seen for a fortnight or so. I'm glad to hear it, said Miss Tox. The other young woman is her unmarried sister who lives with them and take care of her children. Her name's Jemima. How do you do, Jemima? I'm pretty well, I thank you, ma'am, returned Jemima. I'm very glad indeed to hear it, said Miss Tox. I hope you'll keep so. Five children, youngest six weeks. The fine little boy with the blister on his nose is the eldest. The blister, I believe, said Miss Tox, looking round upon the family, is not constitutional, but accidental. The apple-faced man was understood to growl, flat iron. I beg your pardon, sir, said Miss Tox. Did you... Glad I hear you repeated. Oh, yes, Miss Tox. Yes, quite true. I forgot. The little creature in his mother's absence, melty, warm, flat iron, 
You're quite right, sir. You are going to have the, the goodness to inform me when we arrive at the door that you were by trade a stoker, said the man. A choker, said Miss Tox, quite a guess. Stoker, said the man, steam engine. Oh, said, returned Miss Tox, looking thoughtfully at him, seeming still to have but a very imperfect understanding of his meaning. And how, how do you like it, sir? Which, mum, said the man. That, replied Miss Tox, your trade. Oh, pretty well, mum. The ashes somewhat gets in here, touching his chest. It makes a man speak gruff as at the present, but it is ashes, mum, not crustiness. Miss Tox seemed to be so little enlightened by this reply as to find a difficulty in pursuing the subject, but Mrs. Chick relieved her by entering into a close private examination of Polly, her children, her marriage certificate testimonials, and so forth. Polly coming out unscathed from this ordeal, Mrs. Chick withdrew with the report to her brother's room, and as an emphatic comment on it and corroboration of it, carried the two rosiest little to Tootles with her, Tootle being the family name of the apple-faced family. Mr. Dombey had remained in his own apartment since the death of his wife, absorbed in visions of the youth, education, and destination of his baby son. Something lay at the bottom of his cool heart, colder and heavier than its ordinary load, but it was more a sense of the child's loss than his own, awakening with him an almost angry sorrow that the life and progress on which he built such hopes should be endangered in the onset, outset by so mean a want that Dombey and son should be tottering for a nurse was a sore humiliation. And yet in his pride and jealousy he viewed with so much bitterness the thought of being dependent for the very first step towards the accomplishment of his soul's desire or a hired serving woman who would be to the child for the first time all that even his alliances could have made his own alliance could made have made his own wife that in every new rejection of a candidate he felt a secret pleasure. The time had now come, however, when he could no longer be divided between these two sets of feelings. The less so so as there seemed to be no flaw in the title of Polly Tootle after his sister had set it forth, with many commendations on the d indefatigable friendship of Miss Tox. These children look healthy, said Mr. Dombey, but to think of their someday claiming a sort of relationship to Paul. Take them away. Louisa, let me see this woman and her husband. Mrs. Chick bore off the tender pair of toodles and presently returned with that tougher couple whose presence her brother had commanded. My good woman, said Mr. Dombey, turning round in his easy chair as one piece, and not as a man with limbs and joints. I understand you are poor and wish to earn money by nursing a little boy, my son, who has been so prematurely deprived of what can never be replaced. I have no objection to your adding to the comforts of your family by that means. So far as I can tell, you seem to be a deserving object, but I must impose one or two conditions on you before you enter my house in that capacity. While you are here, I must stipulate that you are always known as, say, as Richards, an ordinary name, and convenient. Have you any objection to be known as Richards? You had better consult your husband. As the husband did nothing but chuckle and grinning, continually draw his right hand across his mouth, moistening the palm, Mrs. Tootle, after nudging him twice or thrice in vain, dropped a curtsy and replied, that perhaps, if she was to be called out, out of her name, it would be considered in the wages. Oh, of course, said Mr. Dombey. I desire to make it a question of wages altogether. Now, Richards, if you nurse my bereaved child, I wish you to remember this always. You will receive a liberal stipend in return for the discharge of certain duties and the performance of which I wish you to see as little of your family. I wish to see as little of your family as possible. When those duties cease to be required and rendered, and the stipend ceases to be paid, there is an end of all relations between us. Do you understand me? Mrs. Tootle seemed doubtful about it, and as to the Tootle himself, he had evidently no doubt whatever that he, that he was all, all abroad. You have children of your own, said Mr. Dombey. It is not at all in this bargain that you need become attached to my child, that my child need become attached to you. 
I don't expect or desire anything of the kind. Quite the reverse. When you go away from here, you will have concluded what is a mere matter of bargain and sale, hiring and letting, and will stay away. The child will cease to remember you, and you will cease, if you please, to remember the child. If you enjoyed this video please be sure to hit like subscribe comment below and stay tuned for next installment of charles dickens dombey and son be sure to hit that notification bell